I'm Gary Grafman. I'm so happy to be on this show called Living the Classical Life, and I look forward to our discussion. Mr. Grafman, it's such a delight to welcome you onto our show. Thank you so much for being part of our project and also for welcoming us into your beautiful home. Well, I'm very happy to meet all of you. Having seen all the changes in the music world that you have, what does it take today to form and foster a first-rate talent as a well-rounded artist? Well, first-rate talent should be discovered early. And that's the most important thing. Uh, in other words, people who, let's say, had no background at home in music, at the age of 16 suddenly hear something, uh, Beethoven Symphony, uh, whatever, and, gets, and start getting interested, say, oh, yeah, I want to learn the violin or piano or what, what have you. Sure, th they can learn something, uh, but it's too late. There, it's like... I'm told a tennis player has to be developed early, a swimmer in sports, uh, all the sports, uh, or most. Um, and uh, there are certain, a doctor could explain it, muscle coordination or, you know, God knows what, um, that you do automatically. Uh, so you start early, your talent. Now, not, then what do you need? You need a teacher. You need a good teacher. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody famous. It's, it's somebody, uh, I mean, each, each case is different. And uh, you need pa uh, parental support, but not too much, <laughs> yeah, you, know, you, know, you know. That's one of the problems in China, make them practice 10 hours a day. Yes. Uh, whatever they do, if, this, this is why so many students in every, con uh, Curtis Juilliard viewing, every conservatory here and in Europe um, are Asian. Um, if a Chinese, I mean, you shouldn't generalize, but if, if a Chinese kid at the age of four or five shows some talent in anything, whether it's playing the violin or playing tennis, the parents, it's something a little more than, the, than, than his friends. Mm -hmm. One step above, then take him, well, who's supposed to be the best teacher in Wuhan, if they're in Wuhan? <clears throat> then gets another step, well, there's a conductor of an orchestra there. The conductor wants uh, talented kids, uh, he wants to know about them. Uh, and then they right away it will end up in the pre, uh, whatever, it's not called pre-college there, but whatever it's called, um, uh, under, no, less than undergraduate, but when they're very young, in Shanghai and Beijing, you know, the main conservatories, and, and, and get the, the most intensive uh, work you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and the parents uh, will, whether it's they're studying tennis or piano, will make them practice all day long. I mean, there are exceptions, obviously. If the talent <coughs> has to be discovered early on, is there a risk in doing too much too soon? Too many concerts, too many competitions? Oh, yeah. I was totally against competitions, uh, except, well, the example, example, I didn't allow Lang Lang to play competitions. He would scream and cry and uh, carry on, so I'd let him go to one. But, um, but he followed my advice. Um, and same with Yu Jia Wang. Um, not because, uh, well, the main reason was they didn't need to. Uh, why do you go to competitions? Uh, it's not just the money, uh, you, you win X thousand dollars, uh, but you have concerts. Managers are gonna be there. Uh, people, conductors will, might hear you. It might be the beginning of a career. Even if it's a small co competition, but so in a small area, uh, you'll play with the local orchestra and maybe you'll be re-engaged and then other people will hear you. It, but if you don't need that, in other words, um, when uh, I had, you know, conductors uh, listen to them, because uh, I, you know, I, I, I played with most of the conductors uh, who were around, 
and would then be in town guest conducting Philadelphia Orchestra or conducting here, and the, the kid could come up here and play for them. Um, and they were impressed and were going to engage them either, either right away or a year later or whatever. So why, why bother? If, if you go to competitions, you always have to work on what you think you're playing best. Mm -hmm. And then you're not learning new repertoire because six months later there's another competition. So, well, you don't want to play what you just learned in these six months because it's not ready yet, but what you learned two years ago. So you end up playing the same repertoire. Um, it doesn't work sometimes. Uh, with Hao Chen, uh, uh, Zhang Hao Chen, or Hao Chen Zhang, who just played with Philadelphia Orchestra last week. Um, he also, everybody said he's terrific. Managers said, oh, he's wonderful, but I have too many pianists on my list. The conductor said, I want to hear him again in two years because he's a big talent. But they didn't engage him right away. So he went to the Clyburn competition. I had no objection to that. He had nothing to lose because hmm. nobody offered him anything. Mm -hmm. He got the gold medal, and, and so it worked that way. Each case, you can't... It's special for each per person. Each, each person has, plays differently and has a different career. Can you, as the teacher, influence or foster the individual voice of your students? That's our job, and, um, and that's what we try to do. I, this, probably without thinking about it, because many people ask, have asked me this question, and um, Horowitz probably caused the answer, um, which is, when I played for him, he never went to the piano to show me anything, nothing. Because I guess he realized, I mean, he played in such a convincing way. Even if I disagreed with this, because I might, uh, I was growing up with Horowitz, Rubinstein, Schnabel, and Serkin. Hmm. And so they all influenced, and sure, let's say I preferred this one and this one. Uh, yeah. but, but each one were playing in totally a convincing way, their own way. Um, and probably he felt that maybe I would uh, try to copy or this. I mean, occasionally he would say, uh, you're on the wrong track, but that wasn't often. He, he wouldn't say that he disagrees um, with my interpretation so that I should do it differently. But he would say that although he does it differently, he sees what I'm aiming for and maybe I would succeed better by doing something. And he would be sitting in the couch, let's say, and the piano is over here. Um, and he would say, for example, in this area, and he, he would sing uh, a certain melody and, and, um, and say that I was aiming for this. And even though he did it differently, although he didn't always say he did it differently, but, but he meant that sometimes, uh, that I would succeed better doing different things. So, sure, if the composer writes to play very softly, well, you do have to play very softly. But beyond that, uh, everybody, every artist is different. What was it like playing for Horowitz? Was Horowitz in person very different from Horowitz the legend on stage? Well, I, as I told you, I graduated from Curtis in, when I was 17. And my teacher, Vingerva, who I was with for 10 years there, was a, was a good friend of Horowitz. And she told me, this was one of the times that he took off from giving concerts. He was not playing at all. Mm. He had several such episodes in his life, but this was one of them. And he had heard those years when you played practically anywhere, it was broadcast. Small orchestras were broadcast, the big ones were always broadcast every week. So he had heard me. Um, and he mentioned to her that if I wanted to play for him, he would be happy to hear me because he, he was not, not doing very much. He wasn't, he, wasn't going, he wasn't really going out except to take a walk in Central Park near where he lived. Uh, so, my God. So I went and that developed almost immediately, I mean, within a couple of months, because uh, I was already playing concerts, not a hundred concerts a year yet, but a lot of concerts, um, that I ended up playing for him for one year almost once a week. Hmm. And then for three years after that, about once a month. And spoke to him on the phone. It was five minutes after six that I was to call him because WQXR had news broadcast 
on the hour. And he listened to the six o'clock news, but it was only for five minutes. And he didn't want to be interrupted while listening. So we usually spoke just after that. And he was not doing anything except contemplating starting to make records again, mm -hmm. which is another story. Um, he wanted to know, did I go and hear so-and-so? How was so-and-so? Uh, who's going with whom? Uh, he wanted to know all the gossip about uh, all uh, all, all the colleagues in, in this field. Um, and, uh, and he was interested, uh, we had other things to talk about because he was politically also aware <laughs> of things. And, uh, and he was interested in, um, uh, especially a French Impressionist art and later um, period. So we, we, and he had many wonderful paintings, by the way, at home. So, um, so as I said, the, the first time I played for him, I didn't know what w would come from it. He was then, as I said, he was RCA wanted him to start making records again, and he said, "What should I record? What should you know?" Not that he wanted me to tell him what what to record, but he wanted so, so somebody to talk to. Uh, for example, one of the first records, <coughs> excuse me, at that time were Clementi sonatas. Mm -hmm. And here was a, on his piano, a whole, uh, some old editions of, I don't know, 50 Clementi sonatas or whatever. And he said, well, he, you know, you can only have three or four on this uh, LP. Um, and I can't decide. And, and he played. He just would play one. Mm -hmm. And then next, day, uh, next week he'd play another one. Um, so, so he, uh, well, I would, it was late. He was a late person. I'd come at 8 o'clock. And by 10 o'clock, he'd be through with me. Then he would go and to the piano and play. He would play for you? He would play an incredible amount of stuff, uh, ostensibly to uh, just, well, it, it was, with Clementi, with Scarlatti there, 500-something, Scarlatti sonatas. Well, you can't get 500 on, uh, on an LP. Well, which 10, 12, <laughs> you know, so forth. So he probably played 50 Scarlatti sonatas for me over a period of time. Yeah, would this one go with this one? I've, obviously, he was going to make up his own mind, but he just, you know, wanted sort of to do it. Uh, and the other times that he would play for me, um, Scarabin wasn't played that much at that time, except short pieces. And, and sure, I knew the fifth uh, sonata, which everybody, which, which people who played Scarabin played, and, and a few others. Uh, but he mentioned the eighth. And I said, you know, I don't know that at all. Uh, you don't know the eighth? Well, of course, I can't play the piano anymore because I can't practice and go to the piano and play it all the way through, <laughs> quite <laughs> remarkably. So he did that too. <laughs> so that was, that was quite a, uh, a, a learning experience for me. And, and that, that was those years I was playing, I was going off then and playing with you know, major and minor and uh, orchestras and, and so forth. So we have to ask you, what was Yuja like as a student? We had her on the show, and hers is, uh, to date, our most viewed episode. So we had one insight into her, where she is now. What, sh what was she like as a student? What did she say about me? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she, well, she was one of these extremely fast learners. Mm -hmm. And uh, amazing. Uh, one of the early lessons before I got to know her playing, really, I mean, uh, Obviously, she was accepted because we all heard her at the audition. We all thought she was a, a super major talent. Uh, that she played something with music. Hmm. And uh, I said, I, you know, it's perfectly okay, but I hope you'll do it uh, with that music. She said, no, this is the way I learn things, and uh, without going into detail. And of course, the next time, uh, like, like a week later, um, it was as if she'd played it for, for two years. Uh, and that was her style. It's extremely, uh, no technical problems, but, but, uh, but let me preface by saying that Curtis is not a typical conservatory in that. Uh, last March, we had piano auditions. 116 people applied, uh, three were accepted. Hmm. Not that there were only three good ones, but only three people graduated, so we only had room for three. Hmm. Uh, we have around 19, 19 one nine pianists 
at Curtis, total. Hmm. So, uh, so everybody is on a very high level. Mm -hmm. And and yes, uh, but everybody is also special in their own way. And uh, hers, I mean, uh, immediate and everything. I mean, she right away got interested in playing chamber music. She played with not just with violin and cello, which is the normal uh, thing, but uh, with percussion, uh, with with every possible uh, combination. She she sort of eat it up. Yeah. So I'd like to move on to a subject that. I find very important to me personally. It's not talked about so much, although maybe you might have a different insight into this, and this is musicians' injuries. We both had arm issues uh, or finger issues that prevented us from playing at some point. I've not been able to play for uh, just over a year now. I seem to be getting a little bit better. Uh, but I know that in the 70s, you had some type of injury to your finger, which led to eventually uh, you having to stop playing. Yeah. Well, um, from the age of 20 to 50, I played about 100 concerts a year, hmm. uh, all over, which is more than it would be today because the traveling was more complicated um, and, and so forth. I mean, these days you fly to Australia and play two concerts and come back. Those days, if you flew to Australia, um, you'd stay there for a month. <laughs> you know, it's a big deal. And, and play. So, um, uh, at the about the age of 50, uh, I noticed a problem that I was having, and um, that these two fingers would have a tendency to go down. And um, if I were a, a normal person, I mean, I don't know, a lawyer or something, I probably wouldn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could say it wouldn't have happened, but we don't know. Uh, lawyers can have problems too with it. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, but it meant that suddenly a, a uh, Brahms B flat concerto, the uh, octave thing uh, in the second movement, about da 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 da. Now it's very difficult for anybody. And you don't have a 100% a, a batting average on that, but you have an 85 maybe that it, that it will come out. I mean, not that it'll be a disaster, but um, that it, it might be only 85 or 90, not 100. Uh, but it, but you can do it at 100 too, if you record it, it'll be 100 because you do it a couple of times. Um, and I noticed that I was having problems. It was really not going very well. Hmm. And it was be because you're trying to play this and your finger has gone down to there. So you're playing a wrong note, in effect. Um, and I spoke to Serkin about this. And I remember I was about 50. Uh, and he said, is that the only place in the concerto you're having problems with? And I said, well, uh, I mean, it's a difficult concerto. Not that, I mean, something might go wrong anywhere, but yeah, that's the only one that suddenly is different. Well, if that's the only place you have a problem, is you can go to hell. Oh, <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> you know, so they didn't take me seriously because you know I played the piece really. Yeah, and but it just started to get worse and worse. So that eventually, in uh, like two months later, it was in a different place, um, in, in, uh, because it started to go a little further. And in a short time, I couldn't play anything, really. Mm. Because every, every uh, except some Bach, like, you know, th this kind of thing. Did you have any idea what was going on? Did you consult any type of doctors to try to figure out? Oh, well, out yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, at that point, um, well, I, I canceled concerts then. I, I immediately, well, I couldn't play. So I was, I remember I was supposed to play with Chicago Orchestra and, uh, and, and many others, I mean, many. Uh, uh, this was, you know, huge uh, tour. As I canceled what became two, two years of concerts, 200 concerts, because the concerts are booked ahead of time. And um, I went to countless doctors. Um, and now my friend, Leon, Leon Fleischer, had had a similar problem. Now, I didn't know if it was similar or different, but he had a problem. And his was, I think, at the age of 36, mm. which was quite different than 50. I mean, he was really, you know. Um, and so naturally, I was talking to him a great deal. Um, 
and we went, I mean, we discussed all kinds of things. He had given up going to doctors uh, at that point. Um, because, you know, said, well, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, psychological or this or that, and, you know, because nobody knew. Uh, there was sports medicine, but there was not music and medicine. I'm responsible for music medicine. So I went to all these doctors. Everyone diagnosed it, almost everyone, in whatever their specialty was. <laughs> so I had every possible disease. I had Parkinson's disease. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, doesn't my left hand is perfect um, from that. Well, it's got to start somewhere, he said, you know, very uh, <laughs> encouragingly. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and gave me uh, cinnamon, was that it? Yeah. Um, and he said, so come back, it'll, it'll slow the process, it might even help you. Um, so come to see me in four weeks, but take it for four weeks and, you know, call if there's an emergency. Well, after two weeks I called to say that there's no emergency, but it's uh, as if I'm taking a, uh, nothing. I mean, there's no effect in anything, but it's not an emergency. Well, no, you have your appointment in two weeks. So two weeks later, I saw him, and I said exactly uh, the same as before. And uh, no, I had no ill effects from the drug. So he said, well, I guess you don't have Parkinson's. And since he was a doctor for that, and a very famous one, he lost interest. So there's a lot of that kind of thing. And through friends, I ended up at Mass General Hospital, because there were three doctors who became interested in it, three totally different fields. Um, and I ended up, for one year, getting an apartment, you know, nothing, a studio apartment. In back of the hospital, there's a little housing complex where some of the young doctors live. And uh, Steinway put a piano in that apartment, and the doctors put a, a huge biofeedback machine on the, on the piano, and they came to visit me in every day. When I, was there. I would be there two days a week, then I'd fly, fly back. And so these three doctors would come to the, to the apartment, and I'd end up having, I got to know them very well, I had dinner with them. It became an experimental case. Yeah. And the word focal dystonia, these words focal dystonia, I don't think were mentioned yet. Mm -hmm. And music medicine. Anyway, around that time, the New York Times wrote, in their Sunday uh, Times, a huge thing on my canceling 200 concerts. Was it 200 concerts? Yeah, yeah. Wow. and that I was uh, trying to get help at Mass General. Uh, so Sunday Times, which appears on Saturday night in some places, hmm. on Monday morning, they got countless phones. They, they, I think there were 45 phone calls from different parts of the country, in fact, somebody from uh, abroad, including a sitar player, of all, all musicians, because when an orchestra musician, whose livelihood, of course, depends on playing, being in the orchestra, uh, gets this kind of problem, he hides it and plays as much as possible un until he can't play and doesn't seek help because uh, he won't, his contract won't be renewed. Um, so they got this thing and they started a whole, I mean, many, many hospitals have departments like that now, but it didn't exist. So by accident, I was the uh, one who caused it. We, uh, what, uh, when you're, when you si simply can't play, you can't. You can say you have you have the flu and cancel two weeks of concerts. But <laughs> you, you know, uh, so uh, and also I was I was fifty, which uh, uh, now uh, at my age now seems comparatively young. But still, when I was fifty, I thought, well, you know, I played thirty uh, years of a uh, hundred concerts um, a year and made many records, and you know, it's. Uh, and um, I'm interested in so many other things besides music, and I can teach. So um, it, I, was, I wasn't suicidal about it, although I wasn't happy. Yeah. Were there moments of, of despair in having to switch away from performing? Uh, yes and no, because since the initial diagnoses before I went there were, in some cases, life-threatening, hmm. I think, and it, it turns out no, it's only your hand. It has nothing to do with the rest of your body. In other words, you'll live as long as you would have lived otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, it's only, only this. Well, that was in a way a relief because I'd gotten so many negative things from other doctors before. In what you've learned about focal dystonia now over the years, is there, is there hope for young musicians who have this problem? If 
probably, if this were, in my case, caught at the very beginning, I, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I don't know, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I suspect that in some cases it, it might work, for example, because um, something very simple. When I couldn't do this in the years that, maybe the year before, but I had all these concerts, but I could play octaves doing this, mm -hmm. one, three. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in fact, when I rec recorded the Tchaikovsky Second Concerto with Ormandy and with other rehearsals and stuff, he half jokingly, and maybe only half in, uh, in his case, uh, said, hey, Gary, you're drowning, drowning out my orchestra. Oh. Be well, because <laughs> one, three, three is a stronger finger than five or mm -hmm. four. Usually you play octaves with five and four. Mm -hmm. uh, three is a much stronger finger. And, um, and there are lots of octaves in the Tchaikovsky second. Uh, yes, there and, sure are. Uh, and I have no problem. And I realized later, a year later, that I wasn't doing it this way, I was doing it this way. And I was probably stretching something here. You know, you have this tremendous pressure on the piano, and these fingers are down. So something that's not natural is happening there. So maybe if it's, uh, somebody had Knew, knew things about it then, it told me at that point, maybe it wouldn't have happened or happened much later or I, I don't know. Mr. Grafman, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for joining us and giving us so much of your time. Wonderful to be with you. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>